Okay, dear colleagues, it's my great pleasure to open today's defense. And before passing the floor to our main hero, Anastasia, let me introduce our jury members who will judge today's defense. Yeah? And let me start from our guests of our jury, from Dr. <coughs> Dan Nassil Lamey, from Leibniz Photonics uh, Technology Institute of Te uh, Photonics Technology in uh, Germany. And <clears throat> Dr. Uh, May, uh, she worked, uh, she's working in the closed domain of today's thesis. And you can see her information here. And we strongly uh, are very happy that um, Dr. May agreed to be in our jury and we expect long and interesting discussions today. Next, let me introduce Professor uh, Andrei Sapelkin from Queen Mary's University, London. And Professor uh, Dr. Sapelkin, he is a well-known specialist in um, bio, uh, biophotonics and related questions, and he's also closely related to the topic of the, today's dissertation. And I'm very happy to know Andrei Sapelkin for some time already. I have seen him at several juries of our defenses, and it is my great pleasure to see him once again here. Uh, next is our guest from uh, Israel, uh, Professor Zeev Zaretsky from Bar Ilan University. Professor Zaretsky is a well-known specialist in different domain of optics, biophotonics, and related questions. You see his prominent list of awards and activities on the screen, and his outstanding publication records and age index. So we are very proud that Professor Zaleski agreed to be a member of our jury, and we also hope to have very constructive and detailed discussion today. Thank you very much. Let me now switch to our school tech members of jury, and let me introduce Professor Vladimir Drachov, who is the Director of Engineering uh, <coughs> Center for, of Engineering Physics, to which I belong to. And Professor Drachov is a famous specialist in photonics, plasmonics, integrated photonics, and related questions. And he's one of the great experts in optics and related uh, questions in, in Skoltech for sure. You see the formal parameters of Professor Drachov on the screen. I won't read them. Next is our a new faculty, uh, Professor Vasily Fedotov who joined Skoltech quite recently, but his uh, scientific record is quite impressive and uh, he's strongly related to photonics. He made a great contribution to metamaterials, plasmonics, photonics, and related questions. And we also expect very detailed and uh, constructive discussion today. And finally, let me introduce myself. I'm Nikolai Gipius. It is my great pleasure to be a chair of today's jury. I'm already more or less 10 years in Skoltech, and I hope that today the problem will be, uh, there will be no problems with discussions and questions and everything will go smoothly. And because, because I want to say you, because today we have the defense uh, and must uh, PhD program PhD thesis prepared under the supervision of Dmitry Gorin, who is our uh, great professor in biophotonics, and he has already quite a good record of different uh, thesis uh, defenses, and I have no doubt that today we'll have one more success history, okay? And it would make me even more confident because this is not only Dmitry Gorin, but also Alexei Yashinok, who is our new faculty and who, with, to, to, together with Dmitry Gorin, if I understood correctly, created this nice thesis with a great and the most decisive role of the main hero of today, namely Anastasia Mardalino, to whom I'm very happy to pass the floor now. Anastasia, you have around 40 minutes. Uh, try to keep the time for your presentation. And after that, we'll ask you questions and follow the standard procedure. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Thank you, Nikolai, for a kind introduction. 
So my thesis is dedicated to optical sensors based on hollow core microstructured optical waveguides. And mainly I'm going to talk about two-in-one multispectral refractometry and Raman spectroscopy. So, so clicker, are you going to walk? Okay, good. Uh, so during my today's talk, firstly, I will introduce you, you the background on the topic, uh, then proceed to test the structures and walk you through four investigational chapters of my work and uh, finally the conclusions. So the topic background. Uh, when one needs to take some prop from the human body for some analysis, say, for cancer, there are two main general strategies to do that. The first one is the tissue biopsy, that means that reaching of the tissue of interest directly, taking the cells from here. But sometimes also the liquid biopsy may be appropriate here. And what are the particular biomarkers that can be used in the liquid biopsy? Uh, the general options are molecules and cells. If we still talking about cancer, so the molecules can be tumor antigens, for example, some circulating tumor DNA, and the cells are circulating tumor cells. But uh, several decades ago, a new object that is uh, very interesting as a biomarker was discovered, and they are extracellular vesicles, or the subtype called non-extracellular vesicles uh, or exosomes. And why they are so interesting for diagnosis? Because they appear in uh, blood, uh, for example, early and in higher concentrations than tumor antigen and cir circulating tumor cells. And what, uh, how, how, uh, what they look like, actually, they are capsules uh, with uh, lipid belay with a size, uh, in general, from 40 to 1,000 of nanometer for extracellular vesicles, for small extracellular vesicles or exosomes, it's around 100 of nanometers. And on the um, surface of this uh, extracellular vesicles, there are a number of proteins and also a number of proteins and nucleic acids inside that, in fact, are the text of messages that are transferred by these extracellular vesicles from uh, one cell to another. Uh, and what is the motivation? for this work. So these extracellular vesicles have uh, such a complex structure and the effective utilization of these extracellular vesicles for diagnostic purposes requires proper instrumentation for the isolations and detection and analysis and multimodal sensing for a multifaceted liquid object characterization here could be beneficial both for the extracellular vesicles, but also for other biological objects and complex synthesized structures. And uh, the base for this multifaceted sensing could be this hollow core microstructured optical waveguide. So let's have a more precise look on them. So the one hollow core waveguide that I use has uh, a hollow core with a diameter of the core is around 250 microns and several rows of hollow capillaries around. And for light, it's uh, like a fabri perot resonator, in fact, with a transmission spectrum possessing uh, minima at certain positions that are defined uh, with uh, the wall thickness and the refractive indexes of both uh, the walls and the filler. It can be the air, or if you add some analyte, it will be a liquid core and so on. And uh, based, in fact, on this transmission minima, uh, we may proceed to first uh, two applications of this holocaust waveguide for sensing. It is multi-wavelength refractive index sensing and coating deposition control. So we either adjust the refractive index of the analyte uh, inside or we adjust the wall thickness. Furthermore, just from the fact that this waveguide provides light guiding, uh, here, the improved Raman scattering may be implemented, or the improved version of Raman scattering, that is surface-enhanced Raman scattering. 
so now we can come to the main parts of the future investigational chapters. So we have this waveguide, we have four methods for sensing in this waveguide, and we tested them on a set of analytes. So firstly, we tested Raman scattering in this waveguide uh, on two typical model objects, that is uh, Radomen 6G and BSA. So this is the first investigational chapter. Then, oh, sorry. Uh, Elena, okay. Okay, sorry, probably. Thank you, Sergey, for help. Uh, let me continue, I guess. I hope Zoom still is able to see my screen. Oh, thank you. Uh, so the next chapter, uh, from Raman scattering, we proceed to surface-enhanced Raman scattering and combine it with code and deposition control. And further, we combine two other methods that are multi-wavelength refractive index sensing and Raman scattering, and proceed to using them to more complicated analytes. Uh, firstly, for monodispersed solution of protein BSA and polymer PVP and then to the complex structures. And finally, the last but not the least chapter is about combining these two methods uh, for XSL results. So let's start <clears throat> from the first chapter about Raman scattering in this waveguide compared to, to conventional uh, Raman sensing on the planar substrate. So typically, if you have a very small volume of your liquid sample, and uh, due to concentration, you are not able uh, to dilute it, uh, you typically make a drop on a planar substrate and uh, take it uh, to the Raman spectrometer equipped with a microscope. But in this case, then you focus the objective to a very small hotspot, uh, laser hotspot in this drop. In And in fact, the effective volume that is used uh, to irradiate the molecules and to get uh, the Raman scattering, the effective volume is too small. Meanwhile, in case of the waveguide, the effective volume is much greater due to wave and Therefore, we have more molecules contributing to Raman scattering. And therefore, we have the greater signal even with a low sample volume. Furthermore, in case of a drop, the surface area, the interface between the air around uh, and uh, the liquid, the surface area is quite uh, high. Meanwhile, in case of the waveguide, the surface area is much reduced. Therefore, the evaporation process is reduced. And if the evaporation process is reduced, the concentration change inside the liquid analyte is not happening. Therefore, this method is uh, more suitable for quantitative measurement. And finally, so as I mentioned uh, above, uh, the Holoco waveguide may provide improved Raman signal. Uh, another way to provide an improved Raman signal is SER, surface enhanced Raman scattering. Yeah, it improves signal much better, but at the same time, it requires uh, using some plasmonic substrates that uh, may interact directly with the molecules, uh, the analyte molecules, and uh, therefore the analyte molecules may be distorted. And in some application, it is not desirable to have distorted molecules, the Raman spectra of distorted molecules. Meanwhile, the use of Holoco waveguide provides possibility to study molecule configurations without these distortions. So now let's proceed to the results. So this is um, the Rodamin 6G compared on a drop, around two microliters uh, drop, on a plain substrate and compar uh, co uh, compared with a Holoco waveguide. And here the signal intensity was around 50 times higher. Okay, and then we proceed to another analyte uh, with much more molecular weight, that is uh, BSA, bavin serum albumin. And here we uh, compared even uh, three instances, uh, the BSA in the Holoco waveguide, in a bulk solution means like uh, a solution in a tube, and in a two microliters drop on a planar substrate, and even tested it uh, on uh, several concentrations and compared the slopes of uh, these uh, lines uh, on different substrates. And here we got the signal intensity just around two times, so much lower than for BSA. And how it can be explained? So firstly, uh, the refractive index 
of BSA is higher than that of uh, Radoman G. That means that uh, the difference between the refractive indexes uh, of the analyte and the wall is less, and therefore the contrast of refractive indexes is less, therefore the efficiency of light guiding is uh, less, because we get the less reflection from each surface. Another reason may be the crust formation on the top of the CBSA that prevents uh, light guiding uh, like it could be in a mono-disperse uh, isotropic medium. So uh, let me make a short conclusions of this short chapter. So here it was found that this whole local wave guide really improves Raman peak intensities. This is so-called fiber enhancement. And it was found that this enhancement is different for different analytes, but however, it's still the enhancement Sorry again. Uh, therefore, we proceed to combining this uh, Raman uh, sensing in the waveguide with other methods. Thank you. Uh, so we combine it with other sensing modalities. So the next chapter is uh, using surface enhanced Raman scattering cells and building this substrate in the waveguide. Uh, before building this substrate to the, in the waveguide, uh, we developed a protocol for plane surfaces. And here we compared two protocols. Uh, the first one was uh, using uh, 30 nanometers gold nanoparticles, just uh, like a one step gold deposition protocol. The 30 nanometers is an uh, optimal size of gold nanoparticles for cells. And another way was uh, using much smaller gold seeds, like three, eight uh, nanometers. And the second step was uh, additional gold um, reduction on them using uh, the ultraviolet mediation of gold reduction from the chlorouric acid. And then uh, comparing the intensities uh, of uh, cells by these two methods, it was found that on a planar substrate, the two-step uh, algorithm uh, provided much more enhancement. And therefore, we proceeded to uh, move in uh, this uh, protocol to the holoco waveguide. And uh, comparing with the case on the planar substrate, uh, the holoco waveguide still provided some search enhancement, but it was uh, much lower than uh, in case of a um, planar substrate. But still, uh, as we work in, uh, in the Holoco waveguide, we are able to track this step-by-step -step process of uh, substrate fabrication inside, inside the Holoco waveguide due to shifts in its transmission spectrum. So you remember this minimum in transmission spectra depend uh, on the wall thicknesses. Yeah, and so making this uh, coating inside, uh, we can uh, watch the step-by-step -step increase uh, in spectral shifts. So the conclusion of uh, this part is that a method of ultraviolet mediated to step fabrication of cell substrate was developed. And this method provided a quite good, quite typical source enhancement on planar substrate, but the enhancement was not that great uh, in case of holoco waveguide. That is actually could be um, due to a number of reasons, such as that uh, the method that was chosen for additional gold deposition is ultraviolet mediated gold reduction. So the use of light, but uh, this waveguide itself, it's uh, a struck, uh, a, an object that is uh, that scatters light a lot, but uh, let me leave it to the chapter of about uh, further possible directions of work. So, and uh, furthermore, the advantage of using the Holoco waveguide for building such substrate one off is uh, the possibility to provide a coating deposition control right during the process of uh, substrate building. But another disadvantage is unstable adhesion in it. 
So another chapter, actually, due to a number of disadvantages of the search substrate building that we got in the Holocaust waveguide, we switched to, to combining two other methods uh, in this Holocaust waveguide. So combining Raman scattering with multi-wavelength refractive index sensing. So for that, in fact, uh, the same waveguide uh, may used uh, may be used in two setups. Firstly, the setup for refractive index sensing, where you have a broadband white light source as an input, and on the output you have this quasi sinusoidal transmission spectrum. And uh, on another side, uh, you can place the same waveguide uh, to the Raman setup uh, under the Raman microscope, and uh, in a Backscattered light, uh, you will have the improved Raman uh, spectrum. So uh, this is the results of this two-in-one measurements for the protein BSA. So from one point of view, we have this transmission spectra with minima positions estimated. And from this minima positions, you may extract the values of refractive index uh, on each of these uh, three wavelengths in our case. Yeah? And uh, at the same time, you can measure the Raman spectrum and say, uh, take one of the uh, characteristic peaks of your analyte and track its uh, peak intensity. So in our case, both these dependencies uh, were linear. So we can estimate here the sensitivity and resolutions of these two methods. And in our case, it uh, turned out that the resolution for the refractive index method is uh, better than for Raman. Therefore, if we would like to use this two-in-one uh, system for inverse task uh, and using these uh, curves as calibration curves, so refractive index sensing uh, would be more better for this task. So uh, there are similar measurements for the PVP polymer. Also the refractive index, the Raman index, the sensitivities uh, and resolutions estimated. And then we proceed to, to making complexes and micro bubbles from this uh, BSA protein and PVP polymer. And here uh, I should tell actually why, because our lab is a lab of biophotonics. We have uh, several subgroups and one of subgroups uh, develops uh, contrast agents for ultrasound. And what are contrast agents for ultrasound? They are microbubbles. And the research of our subgroup, uh, of the microbubble subgroup of our biophotonics lab, is are microbubbles uh, from hybrid um, protein polymer structures. So, therefore, we deal with this. Uh, protein polymer structures and uh, the complexes of them have a size from around 10 to 100 nanometers and the micro bubbles are around from one to five micrometers. And uh, for sure that's why the scattering of micro bubbles is much greater than the scattering of uh, much smaller complexes. Uh, so, uh, how to produce them uh, from complexes to microbubbles, you need uh, the sonication process. And uh, in this work, uh, several types of these microbubbles were taken with different ratios between the BSA and polymer parts. And uh, it was found that um, with the greater polymer part, the microbubble size is the greatest, but the concentrations of microbubbles, uh, microbubbles per milliliter, is uh, the least. And if the fraction of the PVP of the polymer uh, decreases, uh, then the size of microbubbles also decreases to two microns, but the concentration increases. And uh, what are about the results of this two-in-one sensing? So all um, Raman spectra of these microbubbles and complexes at uh, 15 micrograms per milliliter, that is a working concentration for their synthesis. Uh, all of them uh, were clearly detectable. And uh, as for the refractive index sensing, uh, the all um, 
values were estimated for complexes, but not all, not all of them were uh, able to estimate for the micro bubbles. That happens again due to the high scattering. For example, this is uh, for one of them. So at a sorry again. Uh, so at a certain concentration. Uh, we still are able to see the minima in the, trans uh, in the transmission spectrum, but uh, with a concentration increase, uh, now we are not able anymore to see any minima distinguishable, and therefore we are not able to extract the refractive index positions. Okay, and I'm not able to click further now. Thank you. Okay, so the chapter conclusion here is that we provided two in one Raman and refractive index sensing in the whole local waveguides. Firstly, for mono component solutions of BSA and PVP, and uh, sensitivity and resolution were estimated for these particular solutions. Yeah? And then we proceeded to more complex protein polymer structures for nano-sized conjugates and micro-sized microbubbles. And in case of microbubbles, the upper limit of the detection was found due to the high scattering. Upper limit of detection in case of refractive indexing. And finally, uh, we started uh, about uh, extracellular vesicles. Uh, and uh, now we explore the possibilities of using this holocore waveguide to this extracellular vesicles. But uh, before proceeding to waveguide for, uh, for extracellular vesicles, there is a task to isolate them. And uh, here I will mention two works of my colleagues on developing methods of uh, extracellular vesicles isolations and uh, how I and uh, Raman spectroscopy was able to assist in this methods. So the first method here is the asymmetric depth filtration that uh, means that uh, the filter has a uh, changing size of its pores with the depths, yeah? And here the Raman spectroscopy was used to distinguish if uh, these uh, spherical objects with a size like exosomes, were they really exosomes? So their main content is lipids and proteins. So there is a hope if we are able to find in this fraction both lipids and uh, proteins, so it should be exosomes. And really the spectral components of both uh, lipids and proteins were found. And uh, along with other methods of um, approving, uh, it was found that uh, this fraction is really contains exosomes. Another method of filtration uh, is a two-phase polymer system filtration. It was developed by our colleagues in Petrov Institute of Oncology in St. Petersburg. And here, two types of polymers are used, PEC and dextran. They have different hydrophobicity, and due to that, one of them are more prone to bind into extracellular vesicles, and uh, the other one is more prone to bind into proteins. And using these polymers, uh, the centrifugations on lower times and uh, speeds uh, may be used compared to, to vesicles isolation without these polymers. Because uh, using centrifugation for isolating extracellular vesicles without polymers, you need ultra centrifugation. That means speeds uh, of around uh, hundred of thousand g and several hours that means you need a very expensive ultra centrifuge so uh, returning to this uh, method my part with uh, raman spectroscopy was to estimate the contents the presence of this polymer components in different fractions during this filtration. And of course, the most interest here was uh, in the final fraction after uh, washing, if still we are able to detect any polymers here. Uh, unfortunately, we found out that yeah, still uh, some uh, dextran was detectable. 
Also here, this is uh, worth noting that this was uh, still investigations in a form of drop that was drying. Uh, and for example, these two spectra are taken from this drop, uh, and this is an illustration uh, how useful may be Raman spectroscopy to determine the contents of your liquid probe containing different uh, phases as due to characteristic peaks in Raman spectra in different regions. Uh, on, on different uh, phase regions, you may uh, determine the contents of these regions. So, and here we are able to see how the pack and dextran phases are separate. And then, finally, after extracellular vesicles isolations, let's proceed to, to our two in one extracellular vesicle sensing in the hollow core waveguide. So, there were two methods in our two in one this is refractive index sensing and Raman scattering sensing. And for refractive index, uh, so it worked with extracellular vesicles and with concentrations uh, used, uh, the extracellular vesicles' presence were statistically significantly detected in uh, both solutions. Uh, these concentrations are around uh, 6 uh, to the power of 10, and uh, considering the dilutions, it uh, starts from the 1.5 uh, at the power of 10 uh, particles per milliliter. But as for Raman scattering uh, of axial vesicles uh, in the hollow core waveguide, for these concentrations used, interestingly, we were not able to detect any extracellular vesicles characteristic peaks. But we still were able to detect some characteristic peaks. And exploring them, it turned out that this, all of them belong to the polypropylene. And why polypropylene? Actually, uh, if to remind our Raman setup, Actually, we have uh, an Raman objective, uh, Raman objective on the top. Then we have this uh, waveguide and a polypropylene tube with an analyte. So in this case, we still were not able to see the extracellular vesicle spectra, but we were able to prove that the light passes through the whole holocaust waveguide. In this case, it's around two and uh, a half centimeters. So the laser is able to pass all this waveguide, uh, then uh, irradiate this uh, polypropylene tube uh, bottom, and then the Raman scattering is gathered from here and uh, sent back. So the conclusion for this chapter is that firstly, we used Raman scattering for verification of extracellular vesicle isolation. In case of asymmetric depth filtration, uh, Raman spectroscopy was uh, able to help to determine the proteins and lipids and hence extracellular vesicle presence. And in case of two-phase polymer system, uh, Raman spectroscopy was able to detect polymers presence uh, at a certain limit of detection mentioned above. And furthermore, in, uh, in case of testing our two-in-one sensing system for extracellular vesicles, for refractive index sensing, uh, there was found a significant difference from the controls. Uh, we measured extracellular vesicles at solution with concentration minimum one and a half at the power of 10 particles per milliliter. And for Raman uh, sensing, no extracellular vesicles Raman peaks uh, were detected at uh, the given concentrations, but still we unexpectedly proved uh, the wave guiding. And Finally, the conclusions of the overall works. So firstly, as for Raman sensing in the Holocaust waveguide, it was shown that the use of this two and a half centimeters long Holocaust waveguide allows uh, to increase the intensity of the absorbed Raman scattering in contrast to measuring a drop on a planet substrate. And it was that the enhancement factor is uh, different for different analytes, like for Radomir Sajid, it was around 50, for BSA, <clears throat> uh, that is more larger molecule, it's around 2 and uh, 2.3. And uh, the difference in this enhancement factor uh, may be explained by the difference in the effective refractive index part and also some exploitatory features. 
as about a two in one sentence. So this two in one sentence hollow core waveguide uh, was developed combining multi wavelength uh, refractometry and approved Raman spectroscopy. It was utilized to analyze firstly a high molecule weight compound, uh, specifically BSA protein and actually PVP polymers. The sensitivities and uh, resolutions of both methods were developed. Uh, by the way, the concentrations that were used uh, for BSA it was from 5 to 100 milligram per milliliter. So they contain the physiological values of albumin concentration. So in human plasma, it's from 35 to 50 milligrams per milliliter that uh, makes the method reliable for medical diagnostics in the case of online measurements in some point of care systems. <clears throat> and furthermore, this two-in-one measurement strategy was utilized to examine protein copolymer nanosized conjugates at various concentrations and component ratios, and the effective refractive index and trauma scattering of the mixture different components ratios were obtained. And as for microbubbles, uh, their ability to measure them Transmission spectra of this uh, waveguide filled with aqueous microbubble solutions was demonstrated, and the waveguide transmission spectra shifts exhibited a dependence on microbubble concentrations, but with a maximum detection concentration threshold around four in the power of eight um, particles per milliliter. And above this concentration, the quality of the transmission spectrum of this uh, waveguide deteriorates that can be con attributed to increased light propagation losses caused by light scattering. And as for extracellular vesicles uh, concerning the isolation, in case of two-phase polymer system, it was shown that the Raman spectroscopy can be used to demonstrate the result of phase separation of two high molecular weight components, such as PEC and Dexan in our case, uh, that was used for exercise vesicles isolation. And we were interested in the uh, aspect of the purity of obtained fractions. And as for isometric depth filtration, the Raman spectroscopy of lipid and protein characteristic bands enabled the approval of asymmetric depth filtration for extracellular vesicles isolation. And the part about future directions. So, concerning the Raman in this uh, Holocaust waveguide for extracellular physicals. So, um, actually, in the previous experiments, uh, as you uh, could remember from that uh, chapter, we used three different sources of extracellular physicals. They were either isolated by depth filtration or isolated by a two phase polymer system or they were isolated just uh, actually by size-based uh, uh, filtering. And uh, the future direction here is to use identical XSL physical solutions for Raman measurement, both in a drop in the waveguide. Thus, the potential for, fi for fiber enhancement for XSL physicals uh, will be estimated. Probably in case of XSL physicals, it is not reliable. And finally, uh, another option to improve Raman for extracellular vesicles is to make the indirect uh, Raman sensing. So to use the uh, specific Raman tags and or to use uh, plasmonic particles for cells of extracellular vesicles. Uh, furthermore, uh, also the targeted extracellular vesicles capture in the hollow core waveguide may be provided. So the inner walls may be functionalized with targeting ligands such as uh, specific antibodies to specific proteins uh, on uh, cell vesicles uh, surfaces and so on. And thus the detection of extracellular vesicles will be organized not by the change of refractive index of the core, but by change of the wall thickness in this waveguide. Uh, by the way, if uh, we take a specific antibody that is not on all extracellular vesicles, but only on a specific fraction of extracellular vesicles, for example, some uh, cancer protein, then we will be able to provide specific extracellular vesicle uh, capture. And uh, then it will be interesting to see what is the sensitivity of this method of capturing extracellular vesicles uh, in the waveguide. 
Uh, furthermore, as for surface enhanced Raman scattering in uh, waveguide, so the improvement by annealing and uh, repeated multi-step protocol could be realized. Well, actually, I did it. Uh, I have here a number of samples of this uh, Holoco waveguides with uh, different uh, protocols of SARS uh, deposition, but uh, being honest, uh, none of them worked well for further development of our project, but uh, we still hope that uh, any other options could be possible. Uh, furthermore, uh, also currently we have a lack of uh, Holoco waveguide modeling. Uh, the model of the light propagation and thus the transmission spectrum in this waveguide should be improved, uh, aiming to achieve full agreement with the experimental spectrum. Unfortunately, it's uh, not so currently. And um, after mentioning the future directions that could be implemented, I realized I can't uh, not to tell about the current uh, applications that are already realized by colleagues in our lab. So how this uh, Holoco waveguide sensing is used by other colleagues in the new project. So, uh, there are mainly two of them. So firstly, it's the project about embryology and in vitro fertilization. And here two types of um, objects are used as analyzed. This is salmon plasma and cell medium. Uh, the salmon plasma was used for determination and exploration of male uh, fertility and uh, infertility. And uh, currently it has some promising results and the new grant is uh, received for this topic. So let's look uh, to the results in the year. Yeah. So, and another option, uh, we were able to watch the cell medium. Uh, the goal was the estimation of embryos proliferation, but uh, currently the only what we were able to see in the, those samples actually was the mineral oils that is used in embryology uh, for growing uh, these embryos. So for now, this topic is hindered. And another topic uh, is uh, using uh, some um, um, particles uh, and uh, their modifications. For example, uh, we have another project in our lab with magnetite and its uh, modifications and uh, its modification with um, ultraviolet and so on. And uh, they are not uh, seen well in a case of uh, just a drop on the planet surface, but they are absorbed much better in case of using this holoco waveguide. So, and now, uh, this is really all that I wanted to tell you about my research. I want to tell, say great thanks to my supervisor, to my colleagues, and to all our collaborators. So thank you for the attention. Ah, sorry, the list of my publications, uh, five research articles and two, two uh, book, book chapters and one patent, and a list of my four conferences. And thank you for the attention. Uh, welcome for your questions. Anastasia, thank you very much for very dynamic and interesting presentations. Let's start now. Yeah. <clears throat> Meet dear colleagues. So uh, let's uh, let me remind you the following procedures. So we will start uh, from the questions from the jury members. After that, there will be questions from the audience. So just sit and think. Maybe you have some questions to ask Anastasia. And concerning the questions from the jury members, I will propose the following, that we will go in the order I presented uh, our jury members, and I propose to start from our guests in Zoom, and then we will move to our guests in our room, and we finalize with call them. But if you don't mind, let's follow this sequence. And it is my great pleasure once again to pass the floor to uh, Dr. Shilia Mai, are you ready? Do you hear yes. us? Yes, I can hear you. Thank you very much. We see you and we hear you. The floor is yours. Yeah. 
Uh, first of all, thank you, Anastasia, for this nice presentation. Um, I would have some questions more for the for the SERS part and the Raman part. So I would like to start with um, the fiber enhancement. So you calculated an enhancement factor for the fiber uh, enhancement of for the means XG and um, and BSA, and it was fifty and two point three. Um, do you have an explanation why you have this variation in the enhancement factor on fiber source, uh, fiber ramen, not fiber source, fiber ramen? Uh, thank you, uh, Dana, for your question. Uh, could you repeat, is this your question about how did they cal calculate the enhancement factor or why is it different for this to analyze? First, why it's different. Okay. Uh, by the way, can I use this? A market. Uh, do, do, do you have a marker? Okay, well, uh, but actually, probably I can just tell it uh, just uh, in an uh, oral way. Uh, so the reasons for um, different en enhancement uh, factors. The first one, I guess, uh, is uh, that the difference between the refractive indexes of the BSA and of the glass walls this difference is lower in case of the BSA as an analyte. And uh, the lower this difference, uh, the less uh, reflection we have on each of uh, the surfaces. And uh, thus, the less waveguiding uh, is expected uh, within uh, the same waveguide lens. Uh, the amount of light, the power of light that reaches uh, the another end of the waveguide will be different. This is the first reason. Uh, the second reason is that uh, actually for BSA, the measurement time was quite high. It's around two minutes and uh, to obtain more or less uh, recognizable Raman spectrum. And still during this time, some uh, drying process started here. Yeah, on our top surface. And of course, during that, we have some um, uh, gradient, some change in the refractive index, some change in the transmission properties, some kind of crust here. And of course, this prevents the wave guiding during the whole fiber. Did I answer your question? Yeah, yeah thank you. Then um, we we keep going with this because um, calculating uh, enhancement factor in SERS uh, can be quite challenging. And you presented also an enhancement factor, for instance, on a planar substrate with ten to the power four. Uh, and can you draw on your on, on on this board also the how you calculated the enhancement factor in SERS? Mm -hmm. Uh, yeah, how I calculated the enhancement factor. Actually, there are a number of ways to calculate this enhancement uh, factor. And here I used uh, the most simple way. So just uh, taking an intensity in case of SERS or in case of FAIRS, yeah? Uh, uh, divided by this and then all this fraction is uh, divided by the same values just in case of usual Raman. So uh, if we compare, uh, if we talk in about fiber enhancement, here we compare the fiber intensities and the Raman intensity on a drop. Uh, to estimate the fiber enhancement. And in case of SERS, when we calculate SERS uh, on a drop, uh, 
uh, all these values are for job, but he it's Raman and he it's Sers. And uh, if we calculate the Sers for waveguide, uh, this is intensity of Raman in a bare waveguide, and this is intensity of Sers in the waveguide that is functionalized with gold. So this is a very conservative way to um, to calculate enhancement factor. So you you might maybe underestimate a little bit your enhancement factor, yeah, when you use this, but it's fine, yeah. It's it's a it's a good approach. This is the analytical enhancement factor, yeah. Um, yeah. And um, I think you are also aware of the biggest problem in calculating enhancement factor. Uh, do you do you know this or do you know what I mean when I see what is the biggest problem in, in calculating enhancement factors? Uh, well, I see here two problems. Uh, the first one is that in case of SERS, uh, as SERS uh, is about an effect that is only on the vicinity of the surface of plasmonic substrates, uh, in fact, much less molecules contribute to SERS signal rather than, more, rather than all molecules that just flowing around. Therefore, there's another version of this formula with number of molecule calculated taken into account uh, rather than the overall concentrations. And uh, another problem of SERS that this enhancement is uh, different in different locations of the plasmonic particles because they have hot spots, uh, for example, uh, between uh, two particles if the area is very, uh, if the distance between them is extremely small or the high enhancement factor is uh, on the top, on the apex of some sharp particles like stars and so on. So this enhancement factor is not something that is uniform. Therefore, in our case, we try to take some, uh, I would say, integral value, some uh, value that would be convenient for researchers that want to explore its analyte, uh, yeah, just to understand uh, where the intensity would be better and so on. So because our goal was not to characterize the substrate itself, but uh, to provide it um, as a sensor for practical applications. Yeah, yeah, thank you. So this makes uh, so everything's fine. What you would, what you said, and you you also clearly indicated that the troublemaker is the molecules in the SERS experiment. There's so how many molecules contributing to the SERS enhancement, and there you can can easily manipulate yeah your enhancement factors easily by two orders of magnitude in underestimating the amount of molecules um, uh, contributing to source enhancement. When you use concentrations, you might have an overestimation of uh, of the amount of molecules contributing to source. That means an underestimation of your source enhancement factor. But it's fine. Ten to the power of four, yeah, is a good value. Yeah, I think um, it's a reasonable value and and for a uh, good enhancement factor for planar source substrate. Yeah, so um, everything what you said uh, was correct. Um, then I would like to, to, to you on slide 30, you, you mentioned uh, the source spectrum of rhodamine 6G. So Raman versus source, I think, was this on slide 30. Uh, 30, yeah. Yeah, 30, three, zero. Okay, let us go here. Uh, this one. Yeah, 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 exactly. Yeah, so you, here you have, when I understood it correctly, the blue one is a pure Raman spectrum, and the purple one is a pure source spectrum um, where you have also these gold nanoparticles in the fiber. Uh, both spectra are recorded in the hollow uh, in the holocaust waveguide, but uh, in the bottom, the blue one is in a bare waveguide, and the upper one uh, in a fun in the waveguide that is functionalized with gold. Yeah. Yeah. So that means we can say uh, the blue one is more Raman spectrum, and the purple one more yeah. source spectrum. So this comparison we can make. Um, when you compare here some. Let's say some modes, yeah, peak positions. Um, do you, I mean, for instance, here this mode at eleven eighty seven shifted to twelve oh seven, or in the region about 
um, 50, for instance, you find in the source spectrum, but on the Raman spectrum, can you comment on these changes between the Raman and the source spectrum? Uh, so you mean uh, why the um, positions of Raman shifts uh, of these peaks are different, yeah? Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, so we find that this is uh, due to interaction of uh, the Rodman G molecule with the box of strength. That is, uh, what I mentioned as a general, uh, also a general problem of uh, using cells with its plasmonic uh, pattern. Uh, yeah, so here you can see that uh, really a number of um, peaks are shifted quite significantly. Meanwhile, each of the spectra were recorded uh, five times and averaged. So this is not uh, just uh, some unexpected single values, yeah? so they are uh, averaged uh, data. So I guess uh, the problem is uh, the um, interaction of rather than such a molecule with a recording dot with a gold substrate. But what is interesting also the enhancement factors uh, are different if calculated for different peaks. Yeah. Uh, but, uh, is that okay? Yeah, yeah, yeah. This is this is truly observed, and maybe come to this later. Uh, continue, please. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And uh, what is interesting is that the peak at uh, 775 is uh, not that great shift, and also it is not that great enhanced by steps compared to other peaks. And uh, this is also the only that uh, according to peak assignments below to out of plain uh, CH carbon hydrogen bonds and we assume that the reason is that it is uh, the, mo the one um, piece of the um, molecule that is most far away from the gold surface and uh, it doesn't interact with the gold surface. Meanwhile, the main part of Rodman's molecule that is a lot of the synthesoic rings, uh, it uh, interacts with the both the surface. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, two things um, I think you did not mention so far, um, but could also cause the difference between Raman and Zeus. Mm -hmm. um, one is um, orientation. When I say only orientation, can you pick up it and continue? The orientation of the molecule. Yeah. Uh, yeah, so I guess that, uh, that the Radovan section molecule like, uh, lies on the on its main plane on the on the gold surface and therefore the most of its bands, uh, most of these bands belong to in plane uh, box. Therefore, they are distorted. I mean, um, as you know, for the orientation of, of an insert, so the surface selection modes, yeah, that only Raman modes, which are um, perpendicular to the, uh, to the metallic surface, get um, yeah. enhanced. Yeah? That means when the molecule is orientated like this, then in, in plane modes yeah, are most enhanced. Yeah? And um, so that means the orientation also of the molecule is important. And this is also your reason, what you said correctly, that you, that, that you observe for different um, um, Raman modes, different enhancement factors. Yeah? So this you can also um, align with the orientation of the molecule yeah? towards the metallic surface. And the second one um, is also the, uh, um, the spectroscopic selection rules for Raman are not necessarily true for SIRS, yeah, and then you can also observe Raman forbidden modes under SIRS conditions, yeah. It, this might be a reason why you see under SIRS conditions 1550 mode, but not under Raman conditions. Yeah, but I mean, I do not know in each detail the band assignment, but it might be the reason. Yeah, thank you for your comments. Yeah. Um, so far, I do not have more questions. Maybe the others can continue, and then when I have further questions, I will raise my hand. Okay, <clears throat> thank you very much. 
So, in fact, we can uh, make several rounds of the questions. So, it's not total problems. So, if you would like, uh, we can go to the next jury members. But uh, I just want to remind everybody that, in, uh, according to our procedure, I have to ask everybody to confirm whether or not the uh, jury member agrees with the modification Anastasia made in the final version of the thesis, because we all have received the preliminary version of the thesis, we made our comments, suggesting proposals, and after that Anastasia will make some work, and we have now the final version of the thesis, and for our procedure it's very important to everybody state whether they will agree or not with the modification made. Yeah? So that, uh, so I kind of ask all jury members uh, to answer this question, and otherwise I will need to repeat the question once again for you. Okay. Uh, and now let me pass the floor to our guest, Zeev Daleski from uh, Israel. Uh, can you do it here? Yeah, yeah, I hear you. Great. So first of all, uh, Anastasia, uh, welcome for a very intensive and thorough research, also very interesting research and a very nice presentation. And uh, I do have a uh, few questions. So um, first of all, <coughs> when you use your holocore fiber, can you estimate how many modes, spatial modes, the fiber has? So you mean what is, in fact, uh, you mean what is the power distribution in the whole core? No, I mean how many modes could be guided through your structures and that have the interaction recording in progress with the surrounding? How many special modes your wave guiding structure guided in your experiment? Did you compute this? Did it have a few modes? Did it have a lot of modes? Did you have an estimation of how many special modes the structure you used and was guiding? Uh, thank you for your question. I didn't uh, make a specific uh, calculation for that, but uh, according uh, to the fact that our waveguide belongs to the antiresonant fibers or inhibited coupled um, fibers, it has a particular finite number of modes that are inhibited to couple with the um, cladding modes, and therefore they propagate uh, in the hollow core. Therefore, the answer is that uh, I can't uh, tell you the exact number, but a finite uh, number of uh, modes in the center. And uh, well, overall, of course, it's a finite number, but yeah. it's very important to know whether it is a small number or a large number or a very large number. I will give you an example. For instance, when you couple your light to the fiber, the coupling efficiency or how many modes are excited, it depends on the way you do the coupling. If you have a relatively small number of modes, your measurements repeatability will not be that repeatable because it will be very much dependent on the way you did the coupling. On the other hand, if you have very large number of modes, the sensitivity to coupling will be reduced. So my second question is whether you investigated the repeatability of your measurements in sense of sensitivity to the way you did the coupling between the light source and your wave guiding structure. Yeah, thank you for your question. Uh, actually, I explored it uh, a little uh, bit. So we have a quite large core, in fact, uh, that is uh, 250 microns. And uh, if uh, the um, uh, light from the lamp was more or less um, focused right in the, um, this hollow core, the spectrum on the output was uh, around the same. I'm talking about special modes. Yes, not spec, not the uh, colors. I'm talking about special modes that could travel, special distribution, special modes that yeah. could travel through your wave guiding structure. Some of the modes, by the way, will not be 
traveling through the hollow core. They will be traveling through the cladding. And in my opinion, it's important not only to evaluate how approximately, what is approximately the number of the modes, but also to estimate the, the dependence or the sensitivity of your measurements to the way you did the coupling. I will give you an example. Let's say you excited modes, which are more peripheral. Let's say they are more like a ring in their special distribution. They will uh, be interacting with the cladding much more than modes which are more central to the center of the of the of the uh, hollow structure. So the the effect that you will be measuring will be very different. Now you had many modes. Some of them are like this, and some of them are like this. So you had some kind of averaging effect. And therefore, when you change the way you couple your light source to the structure, and therefore excite different numbers of modes from both sides, from both types, you will have also different effect in sense of the Raman that you get in the output. In my opinion, it's important to estimate this number. It could be calculated. And to relate this number to the sensitivity or the repeatability of the measurements that you that you show. Uh, yes, thank you a lot for your comment. We will do this uh, estimations, uh, seems, uh, but uh, in uh, an experimental way, seems uh, we do not have uh, any great difference uh, when uh, we change the waveguides and focus on and on uh, again. So, so th this could happen if you this could happen if you have very large number of modes. And your yeah. coupling is not very selective. And then you are more repeatable because on average, there is the same amount of interaction with the cladding, but this could be changed. If I take the same structure as you take, and I slightly change the lens that couples the source to the structure such that I will excite, there could be many modes, but due to my coupling, I will excite only the central modes, the, the, the Gaussian modes, they will be less interacting with the cladding and you will have different reading at the output of your structure. Okay. Yeah, so, definitely. Uh, Thank you for your comment. Another thing I wanted to say is that I don't agree with one of the things you stated in your presentation. Maybe I'm mm -hmm. mistaken, but there is something that I don't really agree. You said the following thing. You said, in general, when you do Raman, let's say you take a piece of glass and you put a droplet on top of material on top of it and you measure the Raman, then if you increase the, the, the volume of the material, you have a better signal. You said it. And you said that uh, because when you take the waveguide, the hollow uh, core waveguide, because it is long, so you effectively increase the, the volume of material that interacts with your with your photons and therefore you enhance, you have an enhancement factor that, and besides the cells, you have an enhancement factor that enhances your your uh, Raman signal, right? Right? Uh, yeah, more or less. But uh, I still remind that, uh, of course, the molecule cross-section st uh, stays is the same. And yeah, 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 yeah. But still you say that when it is longer structure, you have more interaction. Okay, more molecules that interact with light. Yes, I don't agree with this statement in the sense that it, it uh, that it uh, improves your enhancement factor. And I will elaborate about it. In my opinion, the way you evaluated your enhancement factor is not very accurate. And I will explain what I mean. When you take a piece, a droplet of liquid with your molecules and you put it on a piece of glass, and now you increase the volume of the liquid, it's true what you said, you have more molecules interacting with light, you have a signal, a stronger signal. But when you do a, a waveguide in which you have long waveguides, so you have a long interaction, it's true that your signal becomes stronger because you have more uh, molecules interacting with light, but you have also more uh, 
a cluster or a background interacting with light. What I mean is that when you increase your droplet on, a, on the same substrate, the substrate is not changing, only the droplet is changing. But when you have a longer waveguide that interacts with light, you have more material, but you have also more interaction of light with the glass, with the waveguiding material. And when you have interaction of light with the waveguiding material, with glass, it generates a lot of cluster. And the longer the structure is, you have more signal, but you have also much more cluster. I will give you an example. Let's say you have fluorescence. Glass has fluorescence. You have a longer structure. The fluorescence, the Raman signal will be increased, but the fluorescence signal will also be increased the longer the structure you have. So in general, I think the motivation or the narrative of saying, let's have a longer waveguiding structure and therefore we improve our signal is not necessarily correct because you increase your signal, but you also destroy your, you increase your cluster as well. And if you compute the ratio between them, both of them increase more or less the same. And since fluorescence and other problematic signals are stronger than your Raman shift, I think they will destroy your, your readout more. So maybe it's even better to have a shorter waveguide rather than a long waveguide to get the same amount of enhancement or enhancement factor or something similar to that. Do you have something to comment on that? Uh, yeah, thank you for your comment. Um, here actually there should be a comparison between hollow core microstructured optical waveguides and solid core microstructured optical waveguides. Uh, both of them uh, in literature, in literature, it may be found that uh, they uh, tried to use for Raman uh, sensing, uh, more or less in the way like I used. But uh, in case of hollow core waveguide, we have much less signal of this glass. And this is really... I agree, but this was not what I was asking. I want you to compare a droplet, a regular case of droplet on a sample of glass versus your waveguides that you are offering to enhance the signal to noise ratio. I want you to compare those two, not to compare two waveguides, one versus the other. I agree with what you said a, a second ago. I agree with this. But my question was to you was to compare the case of not waveguiding measurement, which is the conventional way of measuring versus the way of measurement that you are offering in your research. Yeah, uh, thank you. Well. Actually, if I could have a presentation here, could I have now uh, somewhere in the end? I don't remember the number, but I will find the, no, not not that far. Um, the end. Yeah. Ah. Yeah. Sorry, uh, here the uh, latest uh, spectra on the page. So uh, the spectrum number six is for water in the hollow co waveguide. But this uh, sharp uh, peaks of spectral components, we have already discussed that they belong uh, to the polypropylene, yeah, uh, rather than to the waveguide. Oh, sorry. Yeah, and meanwhile, this is for comparison the um, spectrum of uh, water on, um, I guess, borosilicate glass. Uh, yeah, so actually, at times, uh, I mean, the time of uh, acquisition that is around two minutes maximum time with which we walked uh, in the hollow core waveguide, we still did not have any significant. Um, interference from uh, Raman fluorescence uh, spectrum of our um, glass material. Uh, Nastya, what's the thickness of hollow core as a first wall? What's the thickness if you compare ah, this thickness? Yeah, and, uh, uh, thank you. The thickness is around uh, two microns. So actually, this is a very small amount of uh, glass material. And, so, uh, so this is, by the way, the reason 
The reason is that the thickness is very small versus the case of a regular glass on top of which you would have put a droplet. So this is the reason. But I still claim that what you said, that you, you said that if you increase the length, you have better and better performance. I don't agree with this statement because given the thickness of the glass, when you increase the length, also this, the, the undesired signal coming from the interaction with this thin thickness is also increased versus length, similarly to the way the signal is increased versus length. Yeah, and uh, as for the optimal lens, uh, there was research of uh, another group and they found that the optimal lens of the uh, such hollow co capillaries for Raumann uh, is around from uh, five to eight centimeters. Yeah, and uh, but uh, again, as far as I remember the paper, uh, just uh, furthermore, the wave guiding was not uh, efficient, so there were no further improvement of uh, signal amplitude. Just okay. And by the way, the fact that you said that there is an optimal length strengthens what I said. So, in my opinion, you should better address your enhancement factor because the general statement that you stated at the moment is not, in my opinion, not fully correct because of the fact that there is an optimal length, which means that if you have shorter length, you have less signal, but if you have longer length, you have more clutter. So there is uh, two effects which are fighting with each other. And therefore saying in general that the, the, you have a long structure and this is good, in general, this statement is, is not uh, always true because of what we said a second ago. Uh, okay, I have another question to you. You present in your measurements uh, stocks, right? Those are stocks uh, measurements. Yeah. Did you try to measure anti-stocks? Uh, no, because uh, in uh, my measurements uh, just I was able to use the deletion of uh, any um, low frequency component, yeah, uh, like uh, fluorescence and uh, so on. And uh, sometimes applied uh, preliminary irradiation uh, to avoid the fluorescence right uh, in this place uh, of measurement and so on. Well, anyway, yeah, I, I disagree I with what you say now because in anti-stocks you don't have fluorescence at all yeah i know but also the intensity of raman components is also lower yes but then the length helps you a lot you said that the length is good i'm giving you now an idea when the length is really helping you without a trade-off before you had the trade-off you had a trade-off because you had effects which were undesired effects but uh, but uh, um, if you would have uh, had anti-stocks where you don't have uh, fluorescence at all, in my opinion, then increasing the length could be very advantageous. Okay, this is my thought. Of course, you can uh, take it wherever you want, but uh, just as a comment. I have a, a few more questions to you. Uh, is it okay or we have a time limit or... Can no, I ask another okay. question? Please ask the questions as much as you would like. So it will absolutely open. Okay. okay, we hope that we'll finish till midnight, but... <laughs> yeah, yeah, till midnight, it's fine. Don't worry. Um, but I will ask uh, one more question. In my opinion, the, there is connection between the different chapters that you have mentioned. In all of them, you do Raman, you do measurements with... Uh, 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 light guided structures, there is a, a clear connection. But the way the thesis is presented and also the way, especially the way you did your presentation now, I had the feeling that it's not extremely coherent, the, the various chapters. For instance, you talk about micro bubbles it's like every chapter is, is very different. They, they have the, the, the common ground of the technology, which is the Raman and the wave guiding, but they're extremely different from each other. 
And in my opinion, it could be beneficial if you could better, maybe in your thesis or, or I don't know, better emphasize the, the, the real narrative, the real coherent connection between the different chapters. When you go from your chapter one to the micro bubbles, it's very different topics. So you were extremely productive and you did a lot of uh, interesting and uh, scientifically um, uh, important discoveries. And because you were so productive, you went to many different applications that were very different from each other. But when you write a thesis, there should be, in my opinion, at least some kind of explanation how the narrative, the coherent, in a coherent way, connects all the chapters together from the scientific point of view, not only from the application point of view. You spoke about this, here I measure this, there I measure that, but the technologies, the, the scientific technologies are quite different from one chapter to the other. And I recommend you to add a few paragraphs to explain how the different chapters, the different scientific um, components are bounded together into a unified research. So this is uh, just a comment. Uh, of course, you can take it uh, where you want, but uh, this is what I felt when, especially after listening to your presentation. Yeah, thank you for your comment. Can I add uh, one more comment that probably will let us to join the chapters together? Yeah, sure, of course. Okay, thank you. So actually, probably you could question uh, why the initial motivation was to explore extracellular vesicles, but uh, then we moved to exploring the microbubbles a lot. Well, yeah. And, yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, well, actually, the answer here is that there are these uh, extracellular vesicles are quite uh, complicated uh, objects to study. Well, firstly, you need to grow the cells to isolate the extracellular vesicles. You need to spend several weeks to grow the cells. Probably the cells will die and you will need to grow new cells and so on. Uh, yeah, and uh, also the um, signal from uh, the extracellular vesicles, uh, Raman signal is quite low because in fact, uh, the typical concentrations of extracellular vesicles that we work on are around uh, 3, 5 at the power of 11. And uh, this concentration of particles of extracellular vesicles per milliliter contains just 50 micrograms per milliliter of protein. That is quite low concentration to measure with our Holoco waveguide. Therefore, uh, firstly, we used um, not the extracellular vesicles themselves, but started from more easy analytes uh, with uh, stronger Raman spectrum like Radamin 6G, then proceeded uh, to components uh, that are quite easy to purchase, like BSA protein, by the way, also. still It's still protein, uh, more or less of the same type uh, that is, uh, um, is uh, enriched in the extracellular vesicles. Uh, and uh, also then uh, a mic micro bubbles and uh, this uh, nanostructures of proteins and polymers. This is also a combination of different Raman active components, protein and polymer. Meanwhile, the extracellular vesicles, also a combination of uh, two Raman active components of uh, proteins and lipids but with much lower Raman intensities and uh, much harder to uh, get. As it's uh, much easier to synthesize a lot of uh, protein polymer uh, complexes and microbubbles, uh, and it's much easier than to get the extracellular vesicles from the cells or even from real human. Uh, thank you, Anastasia. I accept your explanation. And by the way, what I said was not a criticism. I do research the same way as well. I start with something, it's interesting, then this is also interesting, and that is interesting. And 
you start jumping from one topic to the other, and this is perfectly okay because scientific curiosity is exactly this. But still, I think that in a in a th in a PhD thesis, which needs to be more coherent, I think uh, also given the explanation you you gave now, I think it could be more um, helpful if you will add a paragraph that better explains. This, th those connections between the chapters and the connection of the micro bubbles with the with the rest of the topics, as you have just explained. In my opinion, it will give the thesis more coherent structure. Thank you a lot for this comment. Uh, actually, in the second edition of, uh, of my thesis, I added two more paragraphs uh, dedicated to it, but probably I need to treat it uh, more diligently. Okay, thank you. I have no thank questions you. anymore. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you very much. Let's now switch to our audience and let me pass the floor to Andrei Sapilkin. Andrei, you're welcome. Yeah, thank you very much. Mm -hmm. yeah, thank you very much. Uh, actually, um, uh, it's it's very nice that you passed to me because uh, I think the question of Vazir was really insightful and very interesting. I mean, it can be a subject of uh, its own research. And I mean, I would pick it up, pick up on that and I'll ask, ask you a question uh, because I mean, there was a, a, a suggestion that there might be some optimal length of the fiber. So how would you arrive to, uh, how would you arrive to uh, analytically? I would, uh, I estimate yeah, analytically. Can you suggest a way of estimating analytically? Uh, no, not by experiment. Well, uh, I would use the wavelength, uh, the standard optimal length, and yeah. build a dependence of uh, independent, independent yeah. of the uh, so, Yeah, so let's, let's pick there. So how would you think that the Raman intensity will depend on length? Well, uh, it's... Uh, oh, no, well, let's say not length, because that's uh, not just the length it depends on on the size of the fiber. Let me rephrase it. How would the signal intensity, Raman signal intensity, depend on the size of the fiber? But still we are talking about length. No, it's not just length that is involved. There's something else that's involved. Okay, about uh, the size. Well, uh, the question is if uh, still our waveguide uh, size change uh, remains to be the center resonance waveguide, the uh, one type that we are using. So, I yeah, mean, yeah. But okay, the type you're remains. Probing, the... You're not probing the length, you're probing uh, numbers of molecules. Yeah. What is else is involved? Yeah, uh, what else is involved uh, is uh, the um, losses during the slants. Yeah, no, losses, yes, it's okay. But there is some other characteristic of the fiber that gives you a number of molecules that you probe apart from the length of the fiber. What is that? The diameter of your yes, pore. Yes, diameter. So how intensity depends on the diameter and the length of the fiber? Well, obviously, if uh, with uh, our core, we still have uh, the same fiber type uh, remaining yeah. and uh, the same uh, distribution of uh, power in our core, yeah, yeah. I, I guess with uh, the greater diameter, we will have uh, the greater signal with uh, given uh, the same fiber lens. Yeah, but I mean, can you, I mean, be, without being sort of pushing it any further, so uh, the cylinder how will it depends yeah. on uh, uh, radius. Uh, on the radius so to the quadratic yeah. degree of radius. How will background depends on radius? The background of the radius uh, to PR, uh, therefore it will depend linearly. Yeah. So what yeah. you need to do is to plot one function, another yeah. function, and see when intercept is, and it will be optimal size. Well, that's of course given that uh, um, uh, you maintain the uh, numbers of modes in the fiber. So you don't change the numbers of modes as a function of radius, for example. And that's, that's I think, was a very nice question. Yeah, uh, so that's why I picked on that. Now, um, going back to, uh, well, I kept quite a few, actually, but going back to uh, the, the question from the previous um, 
a, a member of the uh, jury online, there was this discussion, I think it was slide 30. Ah, slide slide 30. 30. Yeah. Uh, so there was a discussion there about the mechanism of enhancement. Up, up, up. 30, yeah, that's right. Yeah, yeah, yes. There was this discussion here about mechanism of enhancement. And yeah. there was also a conversation uh, of whether this enhancement is due to uh, the distance from the uh, goal nanoparticle. That, we, your, well, that was your point. Uh, once the member of the jury was saying orientation is also involved. Yeah. Can you, for example, figure out whether that's orientation or distance based on your data? Because you said, yeah, maybe this, maybe that. But we can't figure it out. But actually, you can. Right, from this day. Yeah. Well, um, actually, we did not adjust uh, orientation in any specific uh, way, uh, rather than just uh, how, in general, the rhodopin is able to... Yeah, can you judge whether the, the uh, changes in the signal due to orientation or due to rhodopin distance from the uh, gold nanopart? Uh, well, you were saying, actually, what we are saying is that some part of the rhodopin molecule which generate, well, responsible for that mode, may be further away from the uh, gold nanoparticle. That's what you said. And the, uh, uh, the member of the jury said, well, it also can be orientation. So can you say whether it's orientation or the distance? Well, anyway, in our way, that we do not have uh, any molecule that uh, it depends the, all our uh, gold structures, enhancement mm -hmm. structures, now are vertically surrounded. So there's uh, no option uh, for the start axis orientation. So like in one axis, but not in this axis, uh, no more. But how from this fact can I derive if it is about um, orientation or distance, you mean, uh, do we compare the enhancement factor or distance peak, or do we compare what, what, what is that exactly? Well, I think what I'm driving towards is, um, I mean, perhaps a little bit more into the mechanism of enhancement rather than the technical side of things. And mechanism, what's the mechanism of enhancement? What's the mechanism of enhancement? Signal or enhancement uh, on the surface of gold nanoparticles. Yeah, because uh, we have a very strong electric field. Yes, and that electric field is generated by what? By cosmonic nanostructures, by and, and the, the next question is, what is the dependence of plasmon electric field as a, uh, as a function of distance? Uh, it is inversely proportional, inversely proportional yeah. to the radius in the 12 seconds. Yeah, yeah, so it, it drops quite fast. Yes. So what you need again, so this is sort of related to my previous question, ah, you need to compare the size of a molecule to the drop of the field. And what you'll find out, if you have a look, is that molecule is far too small for the drop of the field to make any effect. So it's most likely due to orientation. Yeah. Um, so the other question is, uh, I mean, it's mostly generic questions, really. Uh, oh, yes. Uh, again, being a physicist, I mean, I guess in the same way. Um, you showed quite a few sort of curves where um, uh, you plotted dependence of refractive index as a function of concentrations. Can you bring them up? Any of them? I mean, I think one. Uh... Uh, yeah, I'm going to switch the slides. Okay, thanks. Yeah, well, yeah. this one, for example. Uh, my question is particularly on the refractive index side. Um, so you have these um, um, pit pitted curves, but they all kind of seem to be heading at the origin into a, a different point. They tend what? Excuse me. They, all of these curves tend to a different point at the origin. So, example, BSA mass concentration of zero. Mm -hmm 
would you expect them to end up in a different place? Uh, they say mass concentration zero is just water, yeah. obviously. Yeah, uh, and uh, this uh, three minima, uh, now it's uh, not three, uh, uh, they uh, belong to three um, wavelength positions. Yeah, so the first one is around uh, 500 nanometers, uh, around 600 nanometers, and 800 nanometers. Okay. So, and here we have again the refractive index of water, and water also has a distortion. That means with uh, increasing the wavelengths uh, in this region, the distortion decreases yeah. with increasing the wavelength. So it's okay. Okay. The, yeah, I understand that. And what you mean, you, you did check, and that sort of corresponds to the uh, dispersion coefficient of water at this phase. Yeah. Very good. Thank you very much. Um, and I guess, uh, yes. Um, uh, in a slide 22, um, I had a question. You mentioned some molecular distortions in there. Uh, yes, possible to study molecular configurations, right? So what, what do you mean by molecular configuration? I meant that uh, there are no additional molecular distortion it used uh, in, comparing, uh, in comparison with the SARS where some molecule distortion could take place due to interaction of the molecule with a plasmonic substrate and it uh, happens. Okay, so basically, basically mm. what you're saying there is that there is, there is a fact of interaction between the molecule yeah. and the substrate. Um, and uh, on slide 29, um, you showed nanoparticles there, but I'm, I don't know if there was a size mentioned anywhere. What was the size of the uh, Yeah, uh, sorry, it's not mentioned in the slide. I mentioned it um, in my talk. The uh, one step nanoparticles were of size of around 13 nanometers. So, why is the optimal size for SARS so expected? Yeah, yeah. yeah and um, these particles, uh, they were gold seeds with smaller nanometers of around. Uh, three, eight uh, nanometers, so much smaller. Okay, and then did you, I mean, how does it correlate? Uh, so actually on the uh, right-hand side, this bottom right-hand side picture, where you have increased uh, uh, surf signal. Mm -hmm. uh, what, what I was just going to uh, um, figure out, or trying to figure out, is whether that enhancement in any way is correlated to size of the particle. Well, uh, if we, compare the particles. So this is called go, uh, slide C, yeah, the smallest C from around three, eight uh, nanometers. Yeah. And this is the smallest curve yeah. that is negligibly small compared to all other types. So nanoparticles with a size of 30 mm -hmm. uh, nanometers uh, is obviously have uh, high intensity rather than seeds. But then uh, the slide with seeds was additionally covered uh, with gold uh, mm -hmm. using the ultraviolet gold, uh, ultraviolet mediated gold reduction from the chlorauric acid. Yeah. And after this, uh, the substrate was able to demonstrate the highest uh, signal enhancement. Yeah, and what was the size of nanoparticles there? Well, it, uh, they weren't nanoparticles after that because this process took place on the surface already. So it could be like, uh, uh, it could be estimated like a south of a roughness, of roughness yes, of yes. this nanostructure that is more peculiar to estimate rather than just the size of nanoparticles by using DLS, yeah. So, and we did okay. not estimate uh, this uh, parameter of roughness, uh, but still it could be a nice idea. Okay, yeah. well, to me, it's clearly an obvious question because you'll, yeah. you'll see uh, graduate enhancement. The question is, is it due to size? You say it's not due to size, it's mostly due to roughness, okay? Uh, that's something to, uh, to look into, of course. Uh, well, um, I have quite a few questions, I guess, but mm -hmm. somebody mentioned we can be here until 12. I don't want that to happen, so I'll uh, hand over to the next speaker, or to the next member of jury. Thank you. Let's now ask Vasily to proceed.
his questions. Um, first of all, I would like to comment on uh, on the corrections and modifications made by uh, Anastasia. So um, I, um, uh, when I uh, reviewed her thesis, I kind of decided to show her no mercy, and there were lots of uh, various uh, minor sort of corrections, comments, and suggestions. And overall, I'm satisfied with uh, with the corrections that she made in response to uh, sort of my uh, uh, review report. Um, though there are still some uh, points that I would like to be sort of further clarified uh, and uh, sort of straightened up. Now, um, um, back to questions. So, uh, some of my questions were actually uh, um, asked by uh, uh, previous members, uh, members of the jury, but I still have a couple of uh, uh, left in my uh, list. So, uh, let me maybe start with. Um, so fairly technical question. So, um, if you could, if you could go back to slide eleven or twelve, um, yeah, thank you. Uh, so I'm, I'm looking at the um, uh, SM image of uh, SM image of uh, of microstructured uh, optical fiber, and uh, what I see is that well. At least it appears to me that it's actually a solid core fiber rather than a hollow core fiber. So is it just me or you see that there is a kind of massive uh, white area in the center and uh, uh, some of the uh, micrographs that we show in your thesis uh, show exactly this. Some of them show a uh, really kind of empty region in the center. So uh, which, which, which structure did you use uh, uh, in, in, your, uh, in your study? Yeah, thank you for your question. Well, actually, it wasn't right me who used the scanning electron uh, microscope, but um, I guess that uh, this is due to uh, this is due to a small piece of this wave got actually used and uh, a reflecting uh, surface uh, under that, uh, that wave guide. So you think that that might be due to the effect of the substrate underneath the, uh, yeah. the core? Okay, uh, but um, yeah, so basically m my point is that uh, it, w it, it kind of, um, it, it confuses a bit because some, some pictures do show uh, an empty area in the center and kind of without uh, uh, kind of proper uh, comments or sort of clarification. Um, yeah, uh, some time. images also could be taken from them Raman uh, spectrometer um, from the microscope from here uh, as uh, the, the uh, waveguide also could be clearly visualized. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, uh, now, um, it's um, the, the next question is uh, in, in a way a follow up of uh, Professor Zalewski's uh, question. Um, I um, I noticed that uh, in your experiments, you used a uh, microscope objective to focus light into uh, microstructured optical fiber. So I wonder if, in principle, you could use just a, a well collimated uh, beam of light, because you know the, the size of your uh, the size of the hollow core is uh, of, of the order of 200 microns. So you can easily have uh, you can easily achieve. Uh, a well collimated laser beam of, of that size. So could you not just use a, a well collimated beam to send it through the fiber? Or focusing was was essential, was crucial. Yeah, well, uh, actually, if to have a look on uh, two our of uh, two uh, our setups in case of refractive index uh, sensing, that means in case of uh, measurement of our transmission spectrum, we do not have any microscopic uh, system, any objective for visualization the core. Uh, to focus to that, yeah. So and uh, still, uh, it is uh, as you mentioned, a well calibrated setup where the fiber is just placed and the spectra are quite repeatable. And uh, yeah, probably we could do the same with Raman, but honestly speaking, uh, in case of Raman, we really care even more about the intensity, uh, the form, the visual calibration. It's more or less desirable at the current moment and also at the current 
moment we do not have a proper system of uh, fixing the waveguide uh, right under the beam. Therefore, we check visually every time that uh, we are focused right in the center of waveguide. But again, uh, your concept uh, now is working well in case of effective index measurement, in case of transmission spectrum measurement. Okay, but um, suppose you have a, a, a well collimator, so a, a small parallel beam of light that you send through the core. Do you think it would excite uh, uh, all the modes uh, that that you need for your measurements? Uh, well, what, what do you mean? The different. What uh, is going to be the difference with the previous setup? Yes, when you were sent light focused uh, in the in the hollow core. Uh, the focus. The focused light with a certain aperture angle, yeah, and so on. And what is the question? The question is that uh, if you replace focused light with the parallel beam and ah. you send it uh, ah. into the yeah, if we will have just a parallel beam, so then we will not uh, have uh, any contact with the walls and so on, and therefore we, we are not going to have the sinusoidal structure and thus measure the refractive index. Or, or I wonder if your question was about Raman sense. No, no, the, you, you, you answered it correctly. Yeah. So uh, the point is that focusing is actually important because you want yeah. to... Uh, you want, you want to send light inside uh, at, an ang uh, at an angle or angles. Yeah. Um, okay, and uh, probably my last question. Um, could you explain why uh, you um, elected to use uh, linear fitting for, for your results? And especially in the case of uh, microbubbles, I think it's uh, slide 52 when you only had uh, three points uh, uh, in your measurements. Yeah, actually, it was not that uh, correct for microbubbles, but um, let me firstly um, uh, explain it uh, for these measurements, yeah, for um, mono dispersed uh, solutions with a very low um, extinction. So here, uh, uh, it is really known that the Raman intensity depends uh, in a proportional way on the number of molecules contributing. Therefore, the fact that we got the linear dependence is uh, well uh, approved uh, with the theory. As for the um, refractive index measurements, actually, this is the dielectric constant. This is the dielectric constant that is uh, proportional to the concentration. Actually, there's a, a formula uh, with uh, using the volume fraction, but in fact, you may recalculate the mass fraction to the volume fraction. But the idea is that in our range of concentration, uh, in fact, the volume fraction uh, changes so negligibly like from one to oh, 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 sorry like from zero to around uh, 0 0.12 and so on and in this uh, range uh, the correlation the Pearson correlation between the um, refractive index uh, and uh, concentration the Pearson correlation is, is uh, around equal to one the Therefore, we can consider this dependence as a linear one. Uh, therefore, we use a linear calibration that is also just uh, more comfortable uh, to use uh, them just for, for visual analysis and so on, and also to estimate more or less the sensitivity of matter and so on. Okay. So it's appropriate in our range of concentrations. And in case of bubbles? And in case of uh, macro bubbles, also the um, imaginary part of refractive index uh, starts to take place. Therefore, actually with the enhanced um, extinction, uh, it is uh, not that uh, right to, it, it is not that correct to use uh, this uh, method for measuring them. Uh, therefore, uh, this method of refractive index Sensing is more or less okay for monodispersed solution, still more or less okay for 
complexes as uh, the extinction at, um, ah, this is a slide to the extinction, as the uh, extinction is uh, negligible in the visible uh, light. But still uh, for microbubbles, it's uh, not that great, yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, well then I, I think I exposed my list. Yeah, thank you and... Um, thank you for the questions and comments. Thank you very much, Vasily. Vladimir, your floor is yours. Um, yeah, actually, I, after reading the initial thesis, I provided like 14 uh, questions, suggestions, and I quite satisfied with the, uh, with the answers, which possible to change something, <laughs> but still there are some uh, uh, suggestion potential suggestions in in the presentation first of all of the thesis and mm -hmm. i agree with Ziv Zalewski that uh, it makes sense to uh, to to be focused on some uh, some comparison some analysis and provide some like some uh, let's say backbone in proteins <laughs> and side chains also possible but backbone should be clear through all seasons okay that's just uh, uh, just some general comments and uh, i have some uh, related to some technical and some discussion uh, it's already tradition to start with slide number 30. Uh, yeah, here we see quite a different uh, spectrum of Rodamin 6G uh, relative to uh, bare fiber. And uh, in, in, I just look at the similar spectrum, figure 5.2, uh, just on the plane substrate. And I believe it's shown, yes, right here. Uh, and we see that uh, bulk nanoparticles do not do uh, any difference, uh, like, it's quite uh, reasonably corresponds to uh, rhodamine uh, peaks. But when you do source with your uh, new device, you have some strong changes. Uh, I think it make uh, like quite interesting point uh, to analyze and compare. You see that it's source itself is not the reason it's something combined with uh, with some special modes or uh, like surface interaction or whatever but you have different peaks with uh, hollow core fiber and uh, related to that question uh, you mentioned uh, quantitative measurements in Raman with whole core fiber, and it's already discussed that it's not so simple. But uh, first, first uh, point, as we know, like when we measure Raman with in cubit, let's say Rosamin 6G, and the main problem is to prevent adsorption on the wall. So uh, actually, you cannot say what is the concentration and the volume because <laughs> you always have something on, on the walls. Now, you are adding a lot of walls. And the question is how, how you define concentration. That is first question. Second, uh, uh, 
which molecules contribute in your signal in the whole pore or on the walls. They, they also, since as you mentioned, we have quite complicated modes and they excite Raman uh, molecules and we collect everything from the walls and from the volume question uh, which contribution is uh, uh, is more important in your signal and uh, related question and you then answer like uh, for all of them <laughs> uh, uh, you have quite complicated transmission spectra uh, and you have uh, high transmission like i i don't remember is it relative or just one does it mean really 100 percent or especially okay relative one and then you have some minimum which indicates some resonance mode actually it does not mean that you you just you have losses over there you have a resonance mode and the question for Raman is which wavelength is more efficient in the minimum or at the maximum that's the first question very important and it's quite interesting physics behind that because you have not only excitation wavelength but also scattered wavelengths they are different at different positions and uh, then when you add some new analyte or change concentration you shift minimum and instead of let's say uh, optimal point optimal wavelengths you have i don't know maybe better maybe worse and all this stuff should be analyzed and uh, uh, maybe it makes sense for future work to to put some attention on that okay thank you that's the scope of my questions uh, thank you, Professor Drachov. So let's try to <laughs> recap um, all of them from the very beginning. Okay. Uh, so as for absorption of uh, Radaman 6G just on the walls uh, of the glass uh, capillary, actually, we did not um, consider that we did not uh, estimate the amount of uh, how much uh, really was absorbed uh, but here as i can see the solutions is that uh, depending on the analyte uh, the walls can be uh, like preliminarily charged with uh, plasma treatment by the way as we that uh, uh, have done here with charging uh, them uh, negatively before the third substrate building yeah and uh, also probably some um, surface functionalization with um, some um, prevent with some substrate that would prevent the interaction of our target analyte uh, with the walls. Uh, furthermore, as uh, for the transmission uh, spectra, yeah, uh, let's move to the something like this yeah so from here for example uh, we could uh, estimate uh, which spectrum can we expect which um, in which uh, position inside the transmission spectrum we stay on the particular concentration of say b say right uh, so like we know that for example for uh, 10 milligrams per milliliter at Raman actually 10 milligrams per milliliter here we are uh, our laser at 633 nanometers is somewhere here and um, the Raman signal in some way is in uh, this range actually the um, Raman 
spectra, when uh, it is transformed to nanometers, it uh, would uh, take place of around of uh, half of this maximum region. Therefore, this is an interesting question uh, that uh, which um, um, which waveguide taken with which initial parameters of wall thickness would be optimal for a particular analyte with a particular refractive index. Therefore, it uh, will uh, possess a particular transmission on both the laser wavelengths and on the all uh, Raman uh, spectrum. And uh, therefore, it depends on which particular concentration we are interested in and which particular Raman bands we are going to see. Is it uh, on somewhere here in this uh, range from, uh, uh, is it somewhere around 600 of inverse centimeters with a laser of uh, 633, 600 of inverse centimeters will be, I guess, somewhere around 650, 660 nanometers, I guess, and so on. Or even uh, we are interested to walk in a far Raman range of around uh, 3,000 of inverse centimeters. So it will be definitely another position in that transmission spectrum. So yeah, for future, this uh, question uh, could require investigation for choosing the optimal transmission for optimal Raman measurement then. Okay, uh, okay we're done. Uh, yeah, could you okay. remind the remaining questions uh, we haven't answered? It's okay. I still uh, like, uh, I suspect that minima is just some resonance mode in the farmer. And you should clearly answer whether it's better to uh, illuminate with these excitation wavelengths or not or it's just absorption and it's useless. So that should be answered. Uh, okay, and uh, my last question, what was my last questions? Uh, question, ah, yes, that's quite important. A question, uh, like uh, considering your results, it's. I, I would say it's quite important and indeed it's uh, uh, some new combination of waveguide modes and uh, Raman and refractive index changes and it's quite interesting system. But based on your results, I, I would forget about source because it's completely useless according to your results. It's, it does not say anything. You cannot even calculate uh, average enhancement, but enhancement is not as important. Well, reproducibility, concentration dependence, everything is quite low and just rough estimate of, of the enhancement factor on the plane, much better than in the fiber, right? So what's your opinion? So my opinion, it's useless. What is your opinion? Uh, that source, I mean source. With you mean the investigational chapter about source is, use is uh, useless, right? Uh, no, investigation is very uh, useful. <laughs> uh, answer from your results, uh, like conclusion that I would not use source for any real application. So uh, my question about source, not about your research. <laughs> okay. Uh, so on the current stage of this investigation, uh, really we uh, do not use uh, SERS in holocaust waveguide for some 
practical applications. Because at the, as it was demonstrated, we are able to make SERS substrates with much more enhancement on a planar substrate. Yeah. But uh, it is also worth noting that making a SERS substrate is quite a laborious procedure. Therefore, when we just need to improve the signal a little bit, uh, not that much, uh, like I demonstrated with the applications that are further developed. Uh, it is much more convenient just to take a waveguide and to, to measure a slightly improvement in Raman uh, scattering in a waveguide. So yes, I would agree with you that on the current stage of uh, this investigation, the results obtained with uh, SERS uh, are more or less useless. Well, even, thank you very much. Okay, dear colleagues, so we more or less finished the first round of our questions and answers section. So that's why I would like, before making my final conclusions from my side, I want to ask everybody whether you want also to ask some other questions. I would like to ask uh, yes, another yes. question. You're welcome. Really welcome. Mm -hmm. So, uh, first of all, I agree with what was said uh, a minute ago in respect to slide 36, and it is related to what I asked originally, is that when you show in, in your slide 36 the spectrum, <clears throat> it's important to check whether the minima that you get are indeed due to absorption or due to some modes-related effects because you did not relate in your thesis to this mod-related uh, estimation uh, effects. And <clears throat> if you want to state that you have indeed minima that are caused due to specific measurement, in my opinion, it's important to show at least in computation that indeed it's not um, a mod-related effect, but rather an absorption-related effect. So this is just a comment, but now I have a question. Okay, so in your measurements, uh, Anastasia, you took um, a white light source, you coupled it to your wave guiding structure, and you did the measurements that you did, right? Uh, yes, I had a white light source, uh, then uh, I had a transmit, like, uh, no, I just recorded a spectrum of the white light source. And uh, then I take uh, the spectrum that were from the white light source, but with the Holoco waveguide. And then I divide the spectrum that is obtained with the Holoco waveguide. I divide this spectrum to the lamp spectrum. And therefore I, I get the transmission spectrum yeah, yeah, I agree. I agree. My question is not this. Let's say that you do the same experiment, but instead of the white light source, you take a fem femto laser, femtosecond laser. Femtosecond laser has short pulses. It has also a wide spectrum. So in a way, you could have measured with your spectrometer a similar effect. What, in your opinion, could be the difference? between doing the measurement in the configuration that you did with a regular white light source versus doing the measurement with the femto second laser. Well, uh, first of all, uh, uh, femto and laser. So first of all, if it's a laser, it has a particular wavelength, right? Not a femtosecond laser because it has a very short, well, actually it's a question to you, you tell me. You have a femtosecond laser, how its spectrum looks like? Uh, thank you for your question. Since I asked this question, okay. uh, you should uh, understand that there should be a wide spectrum also for a femtosecond laser. So the answer, it has also a wide spectrum. and. Uh, in a white light source, you have also a wide spectrum. So what could be the difference in the configuration you used in your measurement if you would have if you would have used a, a femtosecond laser? Could it could it be in some way beneficial to the type of measurements you are trying to do, or you would have 
had exactly the same effect. Uh, well, let me think about it. Uh, by the way, yeah, take your time. We have until midnight, so yeah, I'm joking. <laughs> Uh, thanks. Uh, by the way, uh, you mentioned about uh, this um, minima intersmission uh, spectra. They are not to absorption. Yeah, they are due to Fabry pro resonators that we have here. That uh, means like we have. Uh... It was a comment that is not related to my femtosecond laser question. Ah. Okay. It was just a comment on slide 36, given the questions done by the previous reviewer. I, I was now asking only about the femtosecond okay. laser, so, not related to slide 36. Okay, so about the femtosecond laser, uh, the question is, uh, in fact, still our waveguide structure inside for a Fabry uh, pre-resonator is like a um, thin film yeah and uh, in fact we have like a kind of inter interference on the reflection from the thin film and the would you have an interference in the case of femtosecond pulses yeah and here I lead to that uh, if our pulse in time is short enough, we probably will not be able to have this uh, interference uh, because uh, the pulses are too short and they will not be able to interact with each other. But it's true. But on the other hand, you will have a temporal information because you can separate yeah. photons arriving to your detector versus time by, by doing time gating with a reference beam. So if you take both effects into consideration, what do you think will be the advantages or the disadvantages or how could it contribute to, 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 to the outcome of your investigation here? Uh, the advantages and disadvantages of using the femtosecond laser, you mean? Mm -hmm. Yes. Well, so in case of femtosecond laser, we will not have this quasi-sinusoidal structure then, because we will not have uh, this interference, uh, but we will have the widened uh, shape of this uh, pulse. So, it could be an advantage for wave guiding if we, uh, if our goal to uh, precisely to guide the wavelength that is now on the minimum on transmission. Do you think that the temporal information that you could get with a femtosecond laser could help you in separating your Raman signal versus the the clutter signal, the undesired signals you have? Uh, to separate Raman signal from what? Could you repeat? The separating of the signal, which is the Raman, mm -hmm. from the clutter, from the undesired uh, photons that arrive to your output. Could the temporal information help you with it? Well, uh, could this uh, temporal deformation uh, help to distinguish from, uh, you mean the signal from the wall? Yeah. The, the background, yes, yeah, the signal uh, mm -hmm. from the wall. Yeah, clutter, I mean the background, yes, definitely. Uh, yeah. Well, uh, then I guess the most contributing signal will it be just the one that, gu that is guided in the core? Probably the fraction uh, from the fraction of signal that it goes from the core will be, will be better, but uh, I'm not sure actually. Uh, okay, thank you. Uh, about, uh, uh, I forgot to say before, I was asked to say uh, whether the correction are acceptable, what you did, so they are acceptable on, for, on me as well. So the correction in your thesis. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you.
So I don't have any further questions. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Dear colleagues, the same question to everybody. Do we have some further questions, comments, whatever? From my side, I would say that, okay, I'm satisfied with uh, all the modifications that were made, and I have some minor questions that, okay, after all this long and very constructive discussion, they have no sense to be asked, to be honest, because it's some notations. That's not, not at all important. I already yes. found the answers during your I, I didn't formally mention Okay, thank you very much. Well, if there are no more questions from the jury members, maybe we have some questions from the audience. Everybody already a bit tired, in my opinion. Yeah. So in this sense, um, what I would like to say that we are approaching now the very pleasant moment and the word of the supervisors and dear gentlemen, you should decide the order. Okay. Okay, uh, dear colleagues, uh, before uh, sharing my opinion about ASA, uh, I would like to say many thanks uh, my colleagues uh, for very useful uh, comment questions and even ideas. And we are going to use uh, for our further uh, investigation and um, I would like to start that uh, we, uh, okay, first Asia found us by internet. Yeah, and uh, uh, then uh, she joined our lab as uh, five years ago uh, as a research intern in the frame of uh, internal project of uh, Skoltech. And then uh, she obtained a new position, PhD student position of Skoltech. And uh, I would like to say that um, uh, Asia demonstrate uh, ability to, uh, to learn some new techniques. Uh, she has obtained experience uh, to measure by Raman uh, microscopy and spectroscopy. And she spent, uh, okay, I don't know how many days at uh, Plasmonic Lab. Up, and I would like to say many thanks, Professor Drachov, for ability to measurement. And also, um, I said, demonstrate uh, her skills related to the teaching uh, in the frame for uh, teaching assistant loading in the two courses. And also, she uh, uh, demonstrates the ability to transfer her knowledge and even skills to uh, young scientists. For example, uh, Artem Alexandrov is sitting here and uh, he, he is uh, working now at the same setup with the same microstructured waveguide. And um, also I would like to um, uh, stress that uh, Anastasia has very good communication and management uh, skills, uh, even self-management and uh, management myself, for example. And uh, also I guess if you compare uh, communication skills of ASA with uh, biological cell, if uh, uh, our biological cell have the more or less same communication uh, activities, uh, we will be always healthy, uh, I'm sure. And uh, okay, uh, in the end, uh, I guess that um, the, our object was uh, uh, very complex and uh, very interesting for us. We are going to continue this investigation. And um, I think that uh, ASA demonstrate uh, the ability to do independent research. And uh, I would like to ask uh, my colleagues to support her. Uh, yeah, thank you so much. Yeah. And uh, I give a floor to Alexei, please. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, first of all, I also would like to connect with Dmitry to uh, uh, acknowledge the jury member and uh, audience and uh, online uh, jury member. And I know Anastasia, since uh, as Dmitry mentioned, uh, she managed, uh, she um, shared um, and started working with uh, uh, Raman uh, spectroscopy and um, uh, preparing cell, cell substrate and uh, in the frame of the project, uh, internal project of strip. And um, during that time, uh, she she managed to to manage uh, to measure 
lot of uh, make a lot of measurements on the Raman and uh, preparing the research substrate. And this is also continued in the PhD. And uh, she, in, during the PhD time, she uh, managed to quickly uh, start and quickly learn uh, over different disciplines uh, like uh, material chemistry, um, biology, and uh, physical chemistry. And uh, this is, uh, and also she also uh, get a, deep, a deeper knowledge in uh, Raman and uh, in particular in SERS and, uh, and also in uh, this new uh, area like um, uh, hollow structure, hollow, hollow fiber structures. And uh, uh, I also would like to say, say what Anastasia is uh, very motivated creative person and uh, hard, uh, hard uh, worker. And besides uh, the science, she also is very active in, uh, was very active in the social uh, life at, at Skoltech. One example uh, is uh, she is is was organizing um, gathering people together, students, uh, PhD students, and maybe the researchers in a very popular game like uh, when, uh, where, and uh, what in Russian. And uh, this is one example. I, I uh, believe uh, it was a, very, a lot of um, social uh, things in, at Skoltech. And uh, I think uh, Anastasia, uh, during, after, after PhD uh, uh, time, uh, she is very, uh, mature, it's scientific mature person and will be uh, very, um, uh, will have a very uh, impact in, in uh, uh, further in uh, whether she's, she will be working in academia or in company and uh, I believe uh, she is uh, should uh, very de uh, de deserve this uh, with a PhD uh, uh, degree, and I would like to say to and uh, uh, support her, her work here. Thank you. Alexei, thank you very much. So, well, if we have no more questions and words, then uh, I suggest that we follow Elena's instruction because now we are switching to the closed deliberation procedure. Yes, so we kindly ask all uh, the audience to leave the, the room for the defense. So, dear colleagues, so it's my great pleasure to announce that Anastasia uh, passed uh, the defense, but with minor corrections. Yes, so you will have, I think, something like two weeks to make the corrections and uh, to provide it to me, and I will justify that your corrections correspond mm -hmm. to the request. So, uh, dear jury members, and after that, you will receive the PhD of Skaltech, and uh, everything I have show will be perfectly fine. But it is unfortunately not today because several jury members they kindly requested, and it's, I agree with them because there is still some room to improve the thesis. And uh, we decided that also everybody looks very positively on your work, we estimate it as a great work. But it still requires some polishing, and it is in favor of your future career to have the recorded thesis that will be really magnificent. Yeah, because without it, as you have heard, there are several complaints, and I hope it will make progress to all of us. This is your final two weeks of work on this thesis. Okay, with this, I want to congratulate you. And wish you Uh, well, uh, I would like uh, to express uh, my gratitude for all the jury members uh, for all these questions and comments that helped me to improve my thesis and uh, my understanding. And thank you a lot for reading all the stuff. 
so diligently and I also wanted to say thanks to my supervisor, to my co-supervisor, to my uh, colleagues in the 104 room uh, like micro bubbles team uh, that also helped improve the, my thesis a lot and also listened to all my mood problems and so on and also want to express my gratitude to the whole biophotonics lab, to all colleagues that came to support me and all other colleagues and uh, to all my friends, some of them even uh, were today, and uh, to some organizations, uh, social student organizations, as uh, Alexei mentioned, it's really important to uh, maintain the spirit and motivation with something uh, besides the research. Thank you all.